Hello, everyone. Uh, Peter here. I just wanted to give you guys a little bit of an introduction to international relations uh, or international relations theory, IR theory. I'll just call it IR from here. I've mentioned it uh, before. I think it's something uh, everyone who's interested in politics should at least have a, a basic familiarity of. I uh, just wanted to introduce to you uh, a little bit about it uh, by way of this debate between uh, John Eikenberry and John Mearsheimer. Uh, Eikenberry is a, a leading proponent of the liberal school of thought or liberal internationalist school of thought about IR. I'll kind of go in and explain that a little bit. It's not really that interesting, not terribly important, the difference. Uh, uh, all IR thinkers have more or less a, a mix of these various schools. The, they're not really all that competing, thank God, uh, because it's a waste of time. Anyway, uh, Eikenberry is kind of a lead, leading proponent of the liberal internationalist school. Mearsheimer is a leading proponent of the so-called realist school. Uh, by the way, if you're going to co coin a, a title for a particular uh, paradigm or, or, or you know, perspective on a given science, uh, take a lesson from the realists. You should name your school of thought realism. Great move rhetorically. Like you, you're already in a strong position. It's like saying you're not a serious thinker. Like what does that mean exactly? Well. Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll give you some uh, example. But first of all, before I delve into uh, what, what they are arguing about in this video, uh, if you want a one-stop shop, just one book to introduce you to the whole field of IR theory, uh, you could do no better than this little book here, The Social International, uh, sorry, The Social Evolution of International Politics by Shiping Tang. Um, it's relatively short, as you can tell. Uh, but he does a great job of introducing to you all of the, the main uh, uh, perspectives or theories uh, within IR, and he does one better than basically everyone else in the discipline. So kind of the, the, the history of IR, the relevant history for the purposes of this discussion, uh, is that you had a, a lot of, of students of European history, European military, diplomatic, political history, and they tried to, to systematize their study so that they could derive some lessons uh, for how states should behave or how uh, statesmen should guide the governments they have some control over. And so they look at, at European history and they say, oh, okay, well, you need to do this, that, and the other thing because the historical record is clear. Well, what Tang does here is he, he goes a step, or actually, several steps further because instead of saying why would i just stop at 1600 or so uh in order to to learn the relevant lessons from history uh instead he goes back to uh i don't know a couple million years ago uh trying to look at the the history of homo sapiens and our hominid relatives to really get a deep sense of what is our nature first of all what was our developmental trajectory uh, how did we relate to each other as far back as we possibly can tell, given whatever evidence we, we currently have? And then he, he gets to the, the foundation of sedentary civilization some 10, 12,000 years ago and notices that really it's about this time that the, the basic precepts of what's called realism start to apply. Uh, and then the, the, it kind of creates this really nasty logic uh, whereby people's states or kingdoms or tribes or what have you really do have to act like rat bastards in order to survive because you can't really be sure that the neighboring kingdom or tribe or empire or what have you isn't just going to invade you slaughter you take your land enslave your population etc uh, but that this logic begins to change around uh, the the second world war as a result of a number of things uh, cultural changes being one of them, intellectual changes being one of them, but the, the biggest thing is probably the development of uh, nuclear weapons that really make the, the old logic impossible. But anyway, that's what I would recommend to you if you want to read just one book to learn about IR theory, it's that one. There really isn't any competition as far as I'm aware. Uh, everything else attempts to uh, learn lessons from history, but has a very shallow understanding of history. It's basically just European history over the past four or five centuries. Um, and it, it's just far superior for, for that reason only, but also because it, it integrates a bunch of different perspectives and it reviews the, the relevant uh, evidence to a, a much greater extent than every, anything of else of which I'm aware. 
So the reason why I'm going to show you guys uh, this this video debate between Mearsheimer and Eikenberry is that uh, it really kind of lays out, well, I, I'll explain, actually, I won't need to explain by the time I show you guys these videos, so, or these video clips. So first we have uh, Eikenberry, he's, he's kind of laying out the, the problems that the uh, US-led, rules-based, liberal international order is facing. And well-known, widely debated the u.s or western order which has held sway for decades indeed centuries is is giving way in one in one uh, form or another making room for a rising china the non-western world this is something we've been looking at and thinking about for for years now but it's it, it's accelerating in ver various ways certainly with china and it's more assertive personality today but it's also more profound if you will from what uh, the stories of, say, Paul Kennedy's rise and fall of the great powers, because it's not simply a story inside the, the Western family of great powers. It's, it's really between two different kinds of states, U.S. and China, with very different values and objectives, uh, each wanting to make the world safe for a different set of, of institutions and polity principles. So it's a deeper struggle that will be with us for, for probably the rest of our lives. So you, you heard uh, John Eikenberry here say that this the, the, the U.S.-China new Cold War is fundamentally a, a, a struggle between two different, very different types of polities. You've got your, your uh, liberal democracy in the U.S. and uh, this country and its leadership wants to spread the same values that uh, it believes in or its, its rulers believe in around the world. And then there's China, on the other hand, uh, which has, which is more of a, a an authoritarian uh, country. I, I think those are the the terms he probably uh, would use, um, and that they're also motivated by values uh, that are very different from the U.S.'s values. But the the idea here is that the Chinese government is fundamentally the same in outlook as the U.S. government, just with different values to propagate. So the U.S. government wants the, the rest of the world to adopt the same kind of rules of the game, the same uh, basic economic system, the same basic political system, the same basic political economy. And so uh, he also thinks that China wants the rest of the world to adopt its basic values. And I think what a lot of, of, of U.S. Uh, IR theorists do is they they basically just do you know in, in their own terms they do mirror imaging they 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 understand themselves to some extent to a limited extent I would argue um, and then they they project that onto every other government so if the the U S has a motive to uh, spread liberal democracy then China must also have or the Chinese government must also have a motive to spread whatever you want to call the Chinese system, authoritarian capitalism, uh, socialism with Chinese characteristics, uh, whatever you want to call it. The belief there is that the Chinese government has the exact same intentions and motivations as the US government. They want to spread their form of, of government, their political economic system uh, around the world. This is basically just assertive. Uh, there's very little evidence uh, of this that that uh, Chinese intellectuals and uh, foreign policy strategists are are seriously desiring the rest of the world to follow in their own footsteps or or they want the rest of the world to implement the basic basically the same uh, political economic system as China has. This is just asserted and it's a it's an example of mirror imaging. You just project uh, as if you're looking in a mirror what you or your in-group wants and desires and intends to do onto others. Uh, that could be, but I, as you know, the, the evidence of which I'm aware suggests instead that what's actually motivating the Chinese government is a desire to get the boot off their necks. Uh, you know, people in the in the US are are famously or infamously uh, ignorant of other peoples and especially their history. But uh, China had, you know, a pretty brutal past uh, century, at least more like uh, two centuries, where they came to, to uh, realize that these 
far off barbarians that they had never had any interest in before because they had they didn't produce anything that they were uh, terribly desirous of of trading for uh so they they were just kind of like off the map and then all of a sudden these far flung barbarians developed military technology that was far superior to their own and used it to decimate them to to start ripping them apart uh forcing you know basically the they used the british uh army or the british navy rather uh, to let their drug cartels sell dope in China, just as one example. But you had the all of these these European powers, and then later Japan uh, to a much more grievous extent, uh, just invading and carving up little bits uh, of China so that they could profit, or their their uh, the, their wealthy classes could profit through what we would probably call unfair trade today. So I think the the weight of the evidence is much more on the side of the actual motivation of most people leading the chinese government is to simply regain the the kind of stature and safety security that china had enjoyed in uh more distant parts of of their history before these uh western european powers with their superior military technology just came in and shelled cities uh invaded cities burn down a, a, a palace, uh, you know, just looting all of these priceless treasures, etc. That kind of what, you know, what the Chinese call the century of humiliation, I think, is, is a much more likely source of motivation than any sort of desire to spread socialism with Chinese characteristics or whatever you want to call it, authoritarian state capitalism, whatever, whatever your term uh, that you prefer is. Uh, I just don't think that there's any evidence other than looking in the mirror and assuming that everyone else just projecting your group's own desires and intentions on everyone else i think that's really the only evidence here as far as there is any evidence so it's a deeper struggle that will be with us for for probably the rest of our lives yeah uh i i don't mean to to sound uh uh i don't know sarcastic or or uh caustic but It'll be around perhaps for the rest of your life, John, but there's something much more important that will dominate the rest of the lives of people far younger than you, your children, your grandchildren's lives. And so here he's going to, to mention that other issue, which is far, far graver than any sort of, 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 of supposed great power conflict or new cold cold war between the us and china so here he is uh touching on this very briefly the second crisis is what i call the crisis of modernity uh, uh the intensification of 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 economic uh environmental and human interdependence this is uh, liberals talk a lot about this uh perhaps more than than realists uh the arrival of the anthropocene era uh the three great a headless horseman of the apocalypse, the climate crisis, uh, uh, health pandemics, and uh, weapons of mass destruction proliferating on a global scale. Three great uh, threats to not just interstate relations, but to but humanity as itself a, a civilization. Okay, excellent. So he did, in fact, bring up the ecological crisis uh, that we're in, along with, with nuclear proliferation. Um, but that is the key. If you're not focusing on that, you're just not serious. Or you're thinking in an extremely blinkered, uh, almost unimaginably selfish uh, way in that, you know, if, if I only have uh, a decade, maybe two left to live on this earth, then yeah, the, the climate crisis is probably going to be uh, a significant issue you know, over the next decade, certainly over the, the subsequent decade, but I'm going to be off the planet by the time it really, really gets bad. So, you know, it, it just, it's jaw-droppingly irresponsible to be talking about international relations and not making this front and center. In fact, the first two times I, I listened to this debate, I didn't even notice that either of them brought up the, the ecological crisis at all once. On the third time, I realized, oh, right, I can bury at least, to his credit, did bring it up in passing. But sadly, it really is only in passing because very soon after, it's just right back into the new Cold War with China idea.
So as soon as he mentions the ecological crisis, uh, he'll, he'll bring it up as, I'll show you in a, just a second, uh, an, an enormous challenge, especially for the international order in its current uh, state. Uh, but after that, it's off to the races with the U.S.-China Cold War and uh, how the, the kind of degradation of the liberal order is uh, putting the U.S. in a weaker position. So here he goes. And looking for ways to cope with these rising complexities of interdependence would tax, tax any international system, uh, but particularly one that is as degraded as the one that we live in today. We're going to have to reinvent ways to cope uh, uh, with these problems of modernity, and uh, we've only scratched the surface of what that may, may entail. In fact, he and John Mearsheimer don't really even scratch the surface. They kind of point and touch the surface, but they certainly don't even scratch it, let alone delve into this, this problem. How exactly do they propose in either a uh, Mearsheimer's kind of ideal uh, a world of realist states, or rather of governments who follow realist advisors in the mold of John Mearsheimer, or in John Eikenberry's ideal liberal international world order. How, do, how in either of these two scenarios is this just almost mind-boggling challenge of completely restructuring the global economic system so that fossil fuels, fuels are, are phased out and an entirely new energy grid is created, which probably will require a massive amount of, of cooperation between states uh, to share energy, you know, uh, places with lots of land, uh, uh, plenty of good wind power resources, solar power resources, but not much use. Uh, how do we get the energy produced there to other, you know, this sort of thing, this is precisely what IR theorists should be thinking about. And, and laying out plans, whether or not they're followed, at least lay them out, but they don't even scratch the surface here. So let's continue on to the next thing that, that Eikenberry talks about. And thirdly, there's a crisis of liberal democracy, the weakening of the old Western liberal style uh, of, of, of liberal democracy, uh, unraveling in various ways, uh, again, deeper than the, the last president or the most recent cycle of leadership uh, the, the, the erosion of growth coalitions, of, of class compromises, of, uh, uh, of pluralist uh, ethics in the, in the body politic, rising inequality, polarization, uh, populism as a kind of manifestation of this. And I would say it's, it's even deeper than that in the sense that uh, what we often call enlightenment values, open societies, the role, the rule of law, freedom of speech, the integrity of science, the flow of uh, free flow of information, a civil society as a phenomenon outside the, the reach of predatory states. Uh, all of these features we associate with the last 250 years of, 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 of global advancement are, are, are being discussed in a way that suggests they're, they're more fragile than we thought they were, certainly at the time of 1989 when the Berlin Wall fell and we all thought that history had rendered a verdict. Okay, so now might be a good time to, to briefly explain the, the uh, most pertinent differences in worldview between Eikenberry and the liberal internationalists and Mearsheimer and the, the realists, so-called. Uh, so Eikenberry here, you just heard him talk about how the, the kind of liberal international order, uh, it's basically what he's talking about is capitalism, global capitalism led at different times by uh, leading states, leading governments, uh, the British Empire before uh, the U.S. today. Um, I would call it the U.S. Empire, but, you know, that's, again, this, these are semantics, and a lot of IR theorists just argue over semantics. Even in this video, if you watch the whole thing, you'll you'll hear a somewhat funny exchange where uh, Mearsheimer uh, defines the liberal international order. And then Eikenberry says, well, you know, I, I coined the phrase, so, you know, you don't, you don't need to define it for me. But, okay, so here's the, to get to the nub of the difference between them, I think it's probably easier to start with, with Mearsheimer and the realists. So they, they look at, again, it's mostly European history, not to say that that's of no value. I think that's probably pretty uh, relevant to describe most of the world's history, at least starting with sedentary civilization some 10, 12,000 years ago. The, the basic lesson is, look, 
uh, states, governments will do whatever they, they want or need to in their perception to amass more power for the sake of security or even just for the, the sake of more power itself. Uh, you can have uh, leaders at, at different times that are megalomaniacs. They just want to, to control more territory. But regardless, even if, if your country's leadership are not a bunch of psychos and all they want is pure security, uh, safety, well, then what you have to do, given the, the fact that there is no kind of global policeman that you can turn to, uh, to use violence on your behalf to protect your country from an aggressor country because you don't have that they call the the system anarchic so the only thing you have at your disposal is self-help you have to be able to defend yourself so it's incumbent upon every single state every single government to amass enough power always more you can never have enough uh, amass more and more power so that your security uh, is higher. You're you're safer from other states, and so realists basically stop there. It's this is the nature of the the global system. There's no way around that. Uh, you might like to introduce some sort of moral reasoning into this logic, but that would be a category error. Uh, if you if you don't amass power because you think that would be immoral in a given instance. In fact, your refusal to amass power is actually what is immoral, because by refusing to amass power in any given instance, you're leaving your own country at greater risk of extinction. Some other country, because you've not amassed as much power as you could have because of your morality, uh, they now can take advantage of that and invade you, massacre you, uh, annex you, what have you, and now you're extinct. So how's that for your morality? Are you, are you, do you feel satisfied there with your, your little morality? So that, that's kind of the, the realist argument in a, in a nutshell. And then the, the liberal counter argument to that is, well, yes, that is describing much of European history. They would probably say human history, but it's really uh, human history from you know the past 10,000 years or so in uh, larger polities, not in, in smaller throughout this entire period of time, but leaving that aside. Yes, the, you, you realists are, are basically right, but uh, this anarchic world order that you describe is not as dire as you make it sound because uh, states can unify in particular ways. The, the, the major way is by uh, creating international institutions that can be international organizations. It can also just be uh, a set of norms that, that states generally follow because they don't want to uh, be punished by other states for, for being seen to have broken one of these norms. Uh, anyway, so you have these, these international institutions and because there is a, a non-zero sum game dynamic here, Sorry for the interruption there. So I was just saying that the liberals say, yes, we agree with you realists on the, the basic structure of the global order. It's anarchic. So every state has to engage in self-help. They have to gain as much power as they can. But there are instances where cooperation pays, these non-zero-sum games where everyone can benefit from cooperating. And the kind of uh, the most typical example is international trade. So uh, you could just try to invade as many countries as you could and steal their resources and steal their products, but it's actually more beneficial for each individual member state of the global order to cooperate in an international trade regime so that everyone benefits. So they, they point to uh, these, these exceptions that you can, you can create these international institutions that actually change the logic of the game. They change the logic of the world system and make it less brutal and harsh than the, the, the realists might have it. So that's the, the, the basic, uh, uh, most fundamental difference between someone like Eikenberry and Mearsheimer. But when it gets to the particulars, we'll, we'll see a lot more interesting uh, divergences. Okay, so back to Eikenberry. Now he's going to describe uh, how he sees the, the, the current situation of the, the global system and the problems of the international liberal order. We really are uh, 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 
uh, in a hole here, and it's not clear how we're going to get out. And many of us think that the closest moment that looks like today is the kind of 1930s, 1940s, uh, when at that moment, liberal democracy was uh, experiencing a kind of uh, extinction moment. There were major uh, alternative projects for modernity uh, in, commun in the communist and fascist worlds that were growing. Uh, and so there, there is a kind of sense that the stakes have grown and um, the, the uncertainty of, of what, what will come next are, is very strong across the board. And on this point, I think he's absolutely right. The, the closest historical analog to our present condition would be uh, 1930s with the breakdown of the, the thin liberal order. Uh, we could try to distinguish them by saying that today's is a, is a neoliberal order. And actually both Mearsheimer and Eikenberry in this conversation, this debate, uh, use the word neoliberal and understand what it means. Whereas, what, 15 years ago in the mid-2000s, uh, I, I highly doubt if either of them or, or basically many people at all among IR theorists would have been introduced to the concept of, of neoliberalism. It, it really was something that became more widely known in the, the 2010s. But at any rate, yeah, absolutely. Uh, today, the, the the global neoliberal order is is under collapse. Uh, in the 1930s, the global liberal order was uh, facing collapse as well. Uh, and what he says is, in the 30s, you had these alternative paradigms that that were very attractive to different people: the the communist or socialist par paradigm, and then the the fascist paradigm. Uh, but one thing that I don't think I can very really understands or, or or has learned about or has at least uh, really come to grasp is that the the reasons for the crisis are quite similar in both eras and they they come down to an inherent problem of liberal capitalism the concentration of wealth the uh, the barriers that those who currently enjoy wealth put, on erstwhile democratic systems or, or supposedly democratic systems to prevent any reduction in their relative power. So that's what you had in the in the 1930s. You could have had, you know, people like Keynes were were arguing that we need to to fundamentally rewrite the capitalist system because it's not working very well. It's working great for the the, the very rich. Uh, even some of them uh, uh, got ruined in the in the crises of the the 20s and 30s. But regardless, uh, people like Keynes were were you know they they faced a lot of opposition. People who had a very enviable spot in the the order at that time were very harshly against any sort of proposal that would have reduced their relative power and relative status to other people. So they didn't want. Uh, to see a, a, a new deal uh, in the United States. There was massive opposition against even the, the weak tea sort of new deal programs uh, of the US in the 1930s. And today we see the exact same thing. Uh, you, you can read the, the FT every day and see that there are a lot of, of people who are true believers in the liberal capitalist world order who, not, who, who see that there are some deep structural problems that need to be addressed. But then when it comes to uh, uh, whether or not they should support uh, the Corbyn project in the UK or the Sanders project in the US, they shy away from that. They're, that's too radical for them. You have that same kind of opposition from the people who currently benefit from the system to solutions that would save the system itself, that would, that would make the, the, the current capitalist structure uh, much more more tenable, much uh, more sustainable, but because of that diminution in power that they face, they put up massive opposition to it. They just want tiny little tweaks. So those are the things that I think someone coming from a, an ideological position like Eikenberry's, they have a, a, a lot of trouble really wrapping their heads around it to understand that the, the system that they love so much for the, the imagined and real benefits uh, has within it the, the seeds of its own destruction, to, to pull a phrase that uh, one of these two use in this debate. Um, they, they just can't really accept that because it would, it would 
reduce the esteem that they have for this system that they love so much. So it's this kind of blindness on the part of the supporters of the system that's also another parallel between the 1930s and today. So now Eikenberry is going to get into what he thinks uh, the problems, the ultimate causes of the, the crisis that the liberal international order is in right now, what those causes are. Now, obviously, there are deep and proximate causes for this crisis. I, I'll, I think I've said some, a few things about the deep cr uh, crisis, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But I, I also think in the United States, in the American foreign policy establishment, uh, this has been itself part of the problem, a kind of discrediting of internationalism. And I would mention three more proximate causes of the, the problem of, of, of articulating and defending a notion of a US-led order. One is the Iraq War, which I think a, a discredited uh, uh, internationalists, certainly on the Republican side and to some extent on the Democratic side, uh, the 2008 financial crisis, uh, 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 in some sense discredited neoliberalism and kind of international elites, uh, internationalist elites uh, on the Democratic side. And then thirdly, uh, the, the failure of what we might call the liberal bet uh, that China uh, uh, invited to to be a, a, a responsible stakeholder in this order, join the WTO, would would move uh, in a direction closer rather than further away from uh, a liberal democratic system. And so I can bury here is saying it's uh, the Iraq War, the the neoconservative internationalists that were the problem by uh, discrediting U.S. foreign policy with a, a murderous and disastrous war. Uh, and then he, he says the word, the N-word, neoliberalism. So uh, uh, kind of distancing, I guess, perhaps himself a little bit from this, uh, what he might view as a, a, an excessively liberal liberalism in the economic sphere, uh, that it's all about you know, letting bankers do deals uh, without any oversight. Uh, and then he gets to where the debate gets really spicy because uh, he, he brings up the China bet. This idea that by inviting or, or incorporating China into the, the global capitalist system as a subordinate player, as a, as a country that was basically only supposed to do you know, low value added final assembly type work, maybe making some doodads here and there, but nothing at the high end of the spectrum. Uh, that was the, the, the kind of dream. Uh, and so he refers to this as the, the China bet that we incorporate China into the global capitalist system or the liberal international order, and then they will become a responsible stakeholder. And that basically means they're going to follow the rules of the US-led, rules-based liberal international order, basically the order in which the US government makes the rules and everyone else follows. But he doesn't view this in a, in a negative way, primarily because he, like I, am from the US. And so you've got in-group bias operating. You've got uh, a, a biased store of, of information exposure that, that he had. And, and he was, I presume, and it, it seems evident here, that he was kind of insulated from a lot of, of really profound criticism of this system. So he really does believe that it's for the best of, of all. Uh, and that, you know, when China was incorporated into that global capitalist system, they should have just been uh, happy, grateful, uh, and stayed in their lane, uh, which was, so the, 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 uh, the, the aspect of this system that people like I can very think is, is so great is that it's one set of rules and it's supposed to apply to everyone. Of course, you know, if, if pushed, uh, I think you would probably admit that uh, states like the U.S., the hegemonic power in the world, uh, really doesn't have to follow the rules all the time. It's really the rules are primarily for weaker countries relative to the U.S. Um, but the, the the problem with this is that, yeah, you can have uh, equal rules that apply to everyone, but you don't have equal competitors in the system. You have some competitor competitors like the U.S., uh, that was never really decimated by a, a foreign invasion the way that uh, most countries th throughout their histories were. The only foreign invasion in U.S. history is uh, the invasion of the people that lived, used to live within the, the now territorial boundaries of the United States. They were invaded. They were eliminated, genocided, ethnically cleansed. Uh, 
Um, but the, the United States as a, as a polity has never experienced that sort of, of disastrous war. So they were, the US was able to amass power and wealth uh, over the, the past couple of centuries. Uh, and now its corporations, its businesses are at the top of the line in all you know, major fields of production, uh, whatever you wanna look at, uh, computers, aerospace, semiconductors, uh, uh, internet, all of this stuff, absolute top of the line. So you can say from that position, it's only fair to have a, a global system where everyone follows the same rules. But if you're a country like China or basically most countries in the world today, that doesn't really work very well for you because yes, the, the, the playing field is even, but the players on that field are far, far more powerful than you. So even playing field and same rules for all doesn't work very well for you. It's like stepping me stepping into a, a boxing ring with, uh, with Mike Tyson in his prime. We might have the exact same rules. It's fair. The, the, the boxing rink is uh, a ring is, is uh, perfectly flat. But, you know, I think most people when looking at that would recognize there's a, there's a significant problem here because I'm very weak relative to Mike Tyson. So this is not uh, an ideal situation. And I think that's what uh, most governments around the world see. They understand that they cannot compete uh, with U.S. corporations in any area of economic production that they could potentially use to increase their status, increase their standard of living, increase or, or, or rise in the kind of global pecking order. The exceptions to that rule are very illustrative. You've got your, your uh, uh, Japan, uh, South Korea. What really separates them? How are they able to succeed and develop high value added industries like cars and electronics uh, in Japan, uh, steel making, uh, ship construction in, in Korea, also electronics. How? Well, because they were allies of the United States during the Cold War and the US government basically gave them a pass, said, yeah, sure, you can use protectionist measures that we do not allow anyone else in the rules-based liberal international order, US led, trademark, et cetera, uh, you can break those rules because we need you guys to be as strong uh, as possible because you are our allies in this, in this fight against the communist world. So they were given a pass. They were able to use protectionist measures. They were given uh, access to the U.S. market with very little, uh, very few impediments. So their heavily protected, heavily subsidized industries, infant industries, could develop to the point where today your Toyotas and Hondas and Sonys and Samsungs, uh, et cetera, can actually compete. But back you know, a few decades ago, uh, they simply couldn't. They needed that, that period of time of, of being protected from global competition. And so what Eikenberry here is, is, uh, uh, is talking about when he talks about this, this wonderful liberal order, it is you know, nice in the sense that the rules are ideally supposed to be the same for all, except probably the, the hegemon. Um, but that doesn't really matter to a country that isn't already powerful. To a country that isn't already powerful, there is no space in any market for you to, to uh, compete to the level of European or US or Japanese or Korean corporations. You have what's available to you, commodity production. You can, you know, grow coffee and, and cocoa and, and, you know, God knows what else, low value added production, final assembly for high tech uh, products. But that's not going to really move you up the ladder very much at all. So that's something that I think a lot of, of liberal IR theorists really just don't get because they either haven't traveled around the world and talked to, to people outside of, of, of people in other countries who are essentially sycophants of the, the, the dominant global order, or they haven't read uh, serious critiques of that order. They're, they haven't read enough, um, perhaps because they just consider it not serious. You know, that's how our psychology works. When we encounter an argument that challenges our beliefs at a fundamental level, we first feel anxiety 
we we don't like this it's a it's a negative psychological affect that we experience and then the question is how do we deal with that affect i think in most cases we we come up with some rationalization oh this is not a serious argument this isn't a serious book there's there's flaws this isn't considered to be part of the canon that people in my uh scholar in group believe to be a, a valuable contribution to debate so i can just ignore it it's not because it's it's challenging my beliefs and that makes me feel uncomfortable god no heavens no i'm a i'm a serious scholar i would never make a decision like that on that basis but that's in reality psychologically what's going on so I think what we really need to do instead is when we're faced with something that that challenges our beliefs and makes us deeply uncomfortable, we should uh, that should be a, an additional reason to engage, to read it. We should make sure that our our media diet, our intellectual diet, or our, the scholarship that we choose to read, we've got to always be picking arguments and books that make us feel uncomfortable. But I, I doubt if that's very widespread, unfortunately. So let me get back to the, the whole China bet. So uh, this is interesting in the, in the context of this debate, because this is where Mearsheimer can basically do a monster dunk on Eikenberry and other liberal internationalists. So the, you know, again, the bet is we're going to incorporate China into the global capitalist system. Uh, and then that uh, ideally is going to, to lead them to liberalize not only economically, which was a requirement for their entry in the WTO, but also politically. The theory was, you know, as uh, uh, individual investors, individual capitalists within China amass wealth, uh, as hopefully a middle class of some sorts develops there, then with with that kind of material basis in society you're going to have more and more calls for a more liberal political order where individual people and groups can can wrest some power away from the old leadership so that was the the bet uh, that he's talking about and the reason why this is such a, a dunk for for mearsheimer is that mearsheimer and, and realists would have said no 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 you need to focus exclusively uh, on power maximization and preventing other potential future competitors. Even if they're not a real competitor now, you need to always keep your eye on other countries and make sure that they don't amass power to the extent that they might someday in the future challenge you or, or, or you know, uh, uh, threaten your total hegemony over the, over the system as the US. So they would always have said, no, this is a bad idea. And the liberals at the time would have said, no, you're wrong. You don't understand how international institutions can overcome the really brutal realist logic that that is the only logic for you guys. We admit that it is part of the system, but we're saying that in addition to that dog eat dog uh, kind of competition, you have this ability through cooperation, through international institutions to overcome that and, and reap the benefits of cooperation to create non-zero sum games. So uh, I just want to flag this because the, the next thing I'll show you is uh, uh, Mearsheimer really dunking on, on Eikenberry and the liberals. Like this is a, a monster dunk. Like, you know, you, you, you knock the defender over horizontal in midair slam the ball through the hoop and it hits them in the groin on the way down like just a comically uh a monstrous dunk and here here it is so this is john mearsheimer in the top left he's the the realist scholar i i mentioned and then on the top right is a uh, is a uh, professor ed barrett at the uh naval academy i believe it is this is the that's the host for this debate so uh, uh, I just showed you, uh, I can barely talk about the, the China bet and Mearsheimer just now has been saying, you know, because of this China bet, the US essentially has facilitated the economic development of China into such a, a, a level of power that now it can uh, create a, a more powerful military. And of course, from a realist perspective, you know, this is the, the worst possible thing uh, and, and just completely unacceptable, horrible policy. So here's now Mearsheimer uh, about to dunk on uh, Eikenberry and the, and the uh, liberals. And the end result is it's upset the balance of power. And we're now at a point where it may be the case that over time, 
China is by far the most powerful country in Asia, not the United States. This is not in our interest. And we inadvertently caused this situation. And it was because people like you, and not only you by any means, I'm saying you're just reflective of the foreign policy establishment in general, had this idea that by growing China economically, integrating it into institutions and so forth and so on, it would turn into a responsible stakeholder. It was in your terminology, a bet, and we lost. And I'd say the consequences are really disturbing. So that was just a, a little taste of the dunk. Uh, elsewhere in this debate, uh, Mearsheimer lands a, a whole bunch of, of punches uh, along the same lines. But I just wanted to, to let uh, this little clip play for a second because Barrett now is going to jump in and explain the, the kind of liberal thinking at the time, uh, the, the liberal thinking behind the so-called China bet. But the theory is that uh, even though they would become more powerful, um, as the middle class grew, they would liberalize politically. That hasn't happened. That was, I think, seen as a, kind of an iron law of social science uh, until now. Um, so is it the case that, that that law was wrong or that they're going to liberalize? It's just going to take a little bit longer. Yikes. Every time I hear that, I, I wince. Uh, the idea of there being, forget about an iron law in social science, but there being laws at all in social science is just painful to, to hear in the year 2021. Uh, many decades after the, the, the death of positivism as a, a tenable uh, philosophy of science. Nonetheless, it, it still somehow lives on as a zombie in a lot of uh, US political science, I guess Western political science in general, IR theory as well. But he's, he's talking about this idea that, you know, <laughs> oh God. So, you know, you, you could, you could uh, look at a lot of data uh, around the world about countries that are classified as democracies. Um, and you could look at like when they, they were first classified as democracies and then find a correlation between uh, GDP or GDP per capita and when they uh, became democracies according to you know, a bunch of scholars' uh, opinions about what is a democracy and what isn't. Um, and so they, they come up with this idea, they came up with this idea that, you know, uh, uh, economic growth, because we found this correlation in the data, uh, and we're, we're really trying hard to be like natural scientists, even though we're in a completely different realm, that's a far more complex system. So you're never going to find laws. Uh, you're only going to find tendencies, forces that can be constantly canceled out by opposing forces and tendencies. Sometimes they can be accentuated by other forces and tendencies operating in this complex system. But you will never find uh, a, an, a law that universally and always applies. And it's just an absolute fool's errand to look for them in the first place. But regardless, this was a, a popular thought, as Barrett points out, uh, I guess just a decade ago, certainly uh, uh, stretching on for several decades before that, that as countries get more, more wealthy, then the middle classes start to demand a greater share in political power. And then the compromise that's made with them uh, between the, the middle classes and the, the previous ruling class uh, is that they introduce some, some sort of democratic procedures. Uh, let's, let's have people vote for uh, uh, members of the legislature or the executive, et cetera. Um, and, you know, this is the kind of the nice way of, of putting the, the China bet. Um, but, you know, if you look at it from an from a outside perspective, a non-US perspective, if you look at it from the perspective of, you know, the wretched of the earth, so to speak, the, the people in countries that have been brutalized uh, for the past several centuries by the more powerful countries, you might look at it a little differently. You might see it as, uh, the, the Chinese system, the Chinese political economy, uh, prior to reform and opening, uh, was seen as more threatening because they could use a state command system to organize their, their economic growth, to organize their economic system. And, you know, as much as, as they ran into massive, massive problems and, and made enormous mistakes, Nonetheless, the, the history of, of Chinese economic development under Mao in the bad old days of the uh, totalitarian communist command economy 
uh, was actually extremely successful when it comes to building heavy industry, building basic infrastructure, uh, uh, spreading education, uh, uh, increasing healthcare and access to healthcare. Uh, all of these things are really in, indisputable. Uh, the, it's you know you can have ideologues who will say, oh well, we can't trust the numbers, uh, blah, blah blah blah. But if you read the, the the literature on this, it's really not seriously contestable that uh, that system was very successful at these particular things: building heavy industry, building infrastructure. Uh, building the educational and healthcare systems, um, but that that was very threatening because this is a, a a system that is very difficult to integrate to the global capitalist system, where you don't have command economies, you don't have one leviathan, the government, uh, organizing production. You instead have many smaller leviathans, individual investors, individual capitalists, who then compete among each other and among capitalists and investors of other countries. So that's the, 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 the difference in system. Um, and here basically is, is what was hoped for by the people making the, the China bet. Now, you've heard uh, Eikenberry and, and Mearsheimer talk about it from a US perspective. From, say, a, a Chinese perspective, or again, the wretched of the earth perspective, you could look at it instead like this. Our country is going through economic liberalization. The Western powers, the, especially the US, the hegemonic state in the system, want us to be weaker. They want uh, a so-called democratic system where our new capitalist class, the, the newly rich uh, people in China, will now be able to dominate politics as well, just like they do or their counterparts do in the US. If you're a very wealthy individual or, or owner of a, a large corporation, you can translate, you can transfer your economic power into political power in a number of very straightforward ways. Uh, one is just lobbying. You hire very intelligent people who can come up with very plausible sounding rationalizations and justifications for whatever you want to do that will benefit you personally, financially. And these smart people will create arguments that make it sound like what's good for you is actually good for the whole country. And then you get them to try to convince a bunch of politicians. That's one. Uh, another means of, of turning your economic power into political power is by funding uh, think tanks, uh, funding chairs at universities, so that you can, you can uh, essentially help to shape uh, the ideology of the educated classes in society. So you can try to influence economics departments so that they focus on a, a, a paradigm in economics that's very beneficial to your economic interests. And you can, you can try to prevent any other perspectives in economics from becoming dominant in the academy so that you get to, to help shape the, the, the perspective and the worldview of, of generation after generation of student, students who are taking economics or through think tanks. You can fund, again, hire a bunch of smart people. You've got a, a clear ideological orientation for your think tank, and you get them to write reports on a, whatever issue you find important, and you try to, to get that report out to the media, uh, uh, get as many of the educated classes to, to read, to, to adopt this perspective on, on issues that is in accord with your economic interests. And of course, these very smart people at the think tanks will devise an argument for the policy that benefits you in such a way as to make it seem like this actually benefits everyone. And then, of course, lastly, and probably most importantly, is just propaganda. You can transfer your economic power into political power by direct propaganda, uh, buying television ads when there is a, a political debate uh, among various candidates. Uh, that, that paints a policy that might hurt your economic interests, but help the rest of the country, you can fund millions and millions of dollars worth of television ad to try to convince everyone, not just you know, the, the educated elite, but everyone to look at that issue in a way that benefits you. And the perfect example of this is healthcare in the US. You know, the US healthcare system is a, is a laughing stock around the world. Uh, only within the US do you have you know, perfectly smart, uh, educated people who nonetheless believe that the U.S. healthcare system is better than 
the government run alternative. Whereas if you try to make that argument anywhere else in the world, you're just going to get laughed at because there really isn't any real argument there. It's a total loser. But because you've had so many people whose fortunes are tied into the, the, the current uh, US healthcare system as it is, uh, they own health insurance companies, uh, they own pharmaceutical companies or large chunks of them. And they, you know, they, you, you can look at the data that shows that the US spends more on healthcare per capita than any other country. And you might say, well, that's very wasteful. And yes, it is wasteful. It's, that's why it's one of the many reasons why it's just a total loser of a system and there is no real serious argument to defend it. But that money is not it's not wasted in the sense that you know you pay uh, uh for services and then somebody takes a hundred dollar bill and just burns it it's not that form of waste it's waste that goes directly into someone else's pocket it goes into the pockets of the people who own major shares and in health insurance and pharma companies etc so they can use that money that you've given them through this extortionary completely indefensible healthcare system to then pay for propaganda on tv radio newspapers etc uh, that will try to convince people, again, using very smart people who can come up with, with good rationalizations and try to convince people that this system is actually beneficial for them. So that is the kind of system that uh, Eikenberry and other liberals wanted for China, that economic liberalism would come first and then political liberalism would come afterwards. And in a politically liberal system where individual leviathans could translate their economic power into political power you would no longer have a, a you know party control of the society it would be effectively impossible for the chinese government to engage in any sort of major economic policy uh command massive change in the economic structure of the country because anything that would harm the interests of anyone who's currently wealthy in china uh, as soon as that threat appears, those people who are currently wealthy could transfer their economic power into political power and stop that kind of a project, which is exactly what we see in the United States today. And is probably the number one reason why we can't do anything, at least heretofore, we can't do anything serious to deal with the ecological crisis, to deal with climate change. Because anything that is serious, a serious solution, would inevitably require some people whose status is currently at the at the top of the pecking order they would experience a relative drop in their power relative to other citizens in the country uh if their if their fortune is tied into fossil fuel companies well all of that fortune has to go to zero uh that's what is absolutely required we need to phase out the use of fossil fuels if your fortune is tied into ownership of, of fossil fuel infrastructure or or deposits or anything in that in that sector you're going to have to lose and in the 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 u.s politically liberal system you as an individual little leviathan can turn your economic power as these people have been doing decade after decade into political power through exactly the means that I just mentioned. Oh, I, I forgot to mention political campaign contributions, but that's just so obvious that uh, it barely, meant, it barely uh, is, is needed to be discussed. In any case, let me turn the floor back over to John Mearsheimer and let his, uh, his monstrous dunk uh, continue. In the early 1990s, when the Cold War ended, there was a huge amount of optimism in the United States about America's position in the world, about American foreign policy, and about the liberal international order. Uh, in fact, that optimism, I would argue, is reflected in John Eikenberry's classic book, After Victory. If you look at After Victory, which I would encourage you to do, John basically makes the argument that we have found the magic formula for making uh, the liberal international order work for as far as the eye can see. A and moreover, it's going to be a really happy time ahead. We're in the era of peace, love, and dope. Realism is effectively dead, right? Uh, the liberal international order is here to stay. As you all know, something went badly wrong along the way, not in the 1990s. Uh, but it 
began to happen in the early 2000s. And 2016 was really the critical year. Uh, two things happened in 2016 that indicated that the liberal international order was in serious trouble. Uh, one was Brexit. Uh, and then number two was the election of Donald Trump. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about this now, but it's very important to understand that Donald Trump ran against the liberal international order. He hated the liberal international order. He was elected in 2016, and absent COVID, he would have been reelected in 2020. And indeed, even with COVID, if he had acted like an adult over the past year, he would have gotten reelected. And again, he ran against the liberal international order. And then there's Brexit. And my basic argument is the liberal international order is history. It's over, folks. It's, and, and, and my argument, as I'll make clear as I go along here, is that it was doomed from the get-go because it contained the seeds of its own destruction. Now, let me start off by defining what exactly the liberal international order is. Now, let's let's skip the definitions. Uh, I think IR theorists get a little too uh, enthralled with their their attempts to be natural scientists and def defining terms is basically the the closest they can get to uh, how natural scientists do their their uh, inquiries. Um, but then, okay, so that that's basically uh, uh, he, he's he's dunking on the liberals here because he's like, look. In the 1990s, people like me, realists, we were kind of laughed at, scoffed at, like, uh, clearly you guys are wrong uh, because look at what happened. We don't have great power competition so much anymore. We don't have to worry about, you know, Germany fighting France. Uh, we've got this, this liberal international order that is, that is upheld by institutions and the, the promise and reality, I guess they would argue, of uh, the gains of cooperation through trade. Uh, so you realists, you are totally wrong. So now Mearsheimer is, is able to say, ah, ha, ha, well, that only lasted for a couple of decades, guys. Uh, turns out uh, you were wrong and I was right. Um, but I think we should mention, uh, Eikenberry actually brings this up uh, elsewhere, uh, but he says, yeah, but hold on a second. You know, you realists were also wrong. Mearsheimer himself, uh, I think in 1990, 91, published a, a paper uh, predicting a, a return of an arms race in Europe because there is now uh, a multipolar system or really a, a, a unipolar system with the, the U.S. as uh, the, the dominant power, the, the hegemon. But he, he thought that within Europe, now that they weren't unified by the, the Soviet threat, that you would have uh, an arms race between European countries again. And Eikenberry mentions elsewhere in this debate, like, yeah, you realists in the 1990s, you guys were worried about the rise of Germany and Japan as potential uh, competitors of US hegemony. So ha ha ha, you guys were also wrong. And I think they're both right in this, that both sides were uh, quite wrong. Um, but the, the, the main problem about why the, the liberal international order, I think both of them have made uh, pretty good points, but I don't think either of them really get at the, the the core of the problem, which is that because the the liberal international order is based on global capitalism as the way that we organize economic production, and which powerfully influences politics at the same time, which is why I, I typically just like to call it, you know, the political economic system. Because of that, that the 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 core of that system was capitalism. And we can call it neoliberal capitalism because in the 70s you you start to see a uh, an evolution away from uh, Keynesian economic policies or bastardized Keynesian economic policies, as Joan Robinson would I think more accurately call it. Keynes was much more of a uh, of a radical in a sense than the the people that called themselves uh, uh, Keynesians in the 50s, 60s, and 70s during the the global age of capitalism. Uh, so this this neoliberal capitalist order intrinsic to it without any sort of, of, of strong measure from governments to prevent this tendency, it has this strong tendency towards greater and greater concentration of wealth. And that just isn't going to be socially tenable for a species like ours, for Homo sapiens. Part of our, of our evolved psychology is what's been called a egalitarian syndrome that we, we feel very strongly 
about fairness and equality. And of course, fairness and equality can be defined in many different ways and our cultures powerfully influence what we consider to be uh, a fair and equal. But nonetheless, we have this, this intrinsic psychological feature where we, we rebel, we are, we are disgusted by perceived unfairness and we're profoundly uncomfortable with great inequality. And that's precisely what the neoliberal capitalist order produces. And that's really the, the fundamental thing. And, and I want to uh, play something else that Eikenberry says here, uh, where he mentions Keynesianism. But here he's basically coming to terms with the fact that, and now I, I don't know his entire uh, body of, of scholarship, so I don't want to be too unfair to him. It could be that during the 90s and the 2000s, he was pointing out problems uh, with the global capitalist order. At some point in this in this debate, he kind of takes a shot at uh, Thomas Friedman for having this, you know, laughable uh, Pollyannish uh, view of, of globalization, of neoliberal capitalist globalization and how perfect it is and blah, blah, blah. So I'm not sure if, if, if he was consistent throughout his career and he was pointing out these problems uh, throughout, but at least in, in the way that he puts it in, in uh, this debate presently, uh, it doesn't seem like he really understands the, the the fundamental problem and what is required to overcome that. And more, more importantly, the kind of opposition there would be to any attempt to solve those problems because of the way the system is structured in itself. Because individual leviathans can translate their economic power into political power. That's the fundamental problem that I don't think he really recognizes. But let's hear him uh, talk about the, the, the sort of solutions uh, to the, the, the sickness of the liberal inter international order. So here we have uh, Eikenberry mentioning what I think is, is his strongest statement in this debate of uh, the, the problems of the liberal international order and vague sorts of, of solutions. Part of what that system, that more club-oriented character to, to Western liberal order did was it allowed these governments after World War II to create mechanisms through uh, the Bretton Woods system and the trade system to, to reconcile, if you will, openness with uh, economic stability. This is the, the, Keynesian, the Keynesian revolution, developing and putting in the hands of governments capacities to promote full employment and to to have openness to the extent it promoted efficiencies and comparative advantage and, and growth, which uh, is still um, out there as a logic that we want to keep in the, in the system. Okay, so you know, I mentioned before the, the golden age of capitalism, the age of, of bastardized Keynesianism. And what he's saying there is, is accurate. During this period of time, uh, governments around the world had a bit more policy space to determine the, the, the terms on which they would integrate into the global capitalist system. So if they wanted to use a, a bit of uh, protectionist measures uh, to, to develop some infant industries, uh, there was a little more space for that, not as much as Japan and Korea were, were gifted, but nonetheless, uh, during the, the, the you know, so-called golden age, 45 to mid seventies or so, late seventies, uh, governments around the world did have a bit more space so they could protect their societies from the, the radical transformation that they would be forced to undergo if they were integrated into the, again, rules-based liberal international order as it developed in the neoliberal era where any sort of uh, uh, protectionist measures are anathema, can't use them. Uh, uh, progressive taxation is frowned upon because you're, you're taking money away from the job creators, from the investors who are, by definition, by belief, by faith, more efficient and better stewards of, of social wealth than any government could possibly be. Again, no argument really there. It's just pure faith. It's pure belief. So they, they could do that uh, back during the bastardized Keynesian era, but they couldn't do that during the neoliberal era. Uh, capital controls, uh, imposing rules on the, the, the capital investments that are made by foreign investors into domestic economies. Uh, you, can, you can invest in new factories, yes, sure, but you can't just 
uh, bring in capital to put into our stock market and then take it out the next day uh, on your whim. You know, those kinds of capital controls, again, were allowed during the, the early era he's talking about, but then were, were disallowed essentially uh, during the neoliberal era. But, but tempering it with, with uh, uh, if not protectionism, with managed openness that allows governments to overturn commitments to simple openness, uh, as you saw in the 19th century, for, for in, the, in, the, in the name of, of protecting jobs or providing uh, assistance as certain jobs give way and others emerge. So this kind of uh, activist role of, of connecting uh, trade and economic development to, to a full service modern government dedicated to making sure that technology and monetary policy and industrial policy all serve the interests of, of, of the middle class. Because I agree with John, the, 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 the Western societies, starting with the United States, really have taken a, a, a hit. Uh, and, and, and that will never, we will never be able to recreate a, a functioning international order that I would call liberal oriented, a Western liberal order until we connect that internationalism to, to, uh, to these sorts of domestic uh, uh, programs. So he recognizes that Western countries took a hit in the neoliberal era because essentially economic policy became depoliticized. Uh, economic policy is supposed to be run by technocrats, by the, the economics PhDs, uh, who all got trained under the neoclassical school, uh, big believers in the, the wonders of, of free trade and comparative advantage and totally ignorant of the history of economic thought or even the history of economic development. These are the people that should determine economic policy and it should not really be a, a matter for uh, political contestation. And then uh, it turns out, again, owing to the, the, the core of this liberal international system, the global capitalist system, uh, and, and a feature of that, of that core, which is the, the increasing, ever-increasing concentration of wealth, that's the kind of shock he's talking about that Western societies were faced with. And that uh, ended up in political events like uh, Brexit and Trump's election and the, the rise of so-called uh, right-wing populism. Um, but you know, that shock that, that the Western countries, Western middle classes were, were faced with, was not too different from the same shock that the rest of the world was was uh, uh, forced into, but of course they just don't really count. They're not really part of of his worldview. Uh, again, I just think it's because uh, uh, a lot of IR scholars are are very blinkered intellectually. They don't read very. They don't re read widely enough. And of course, I'm not talking about all of them, uh, but it, it certainly seems. From the, the 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 kind of scholars that make up the IR canon uh, in Western universities, that they're just simply ignorant of very powerful critiques that would make them feel deeply uncomfortable. But now that that the causes for those critiques, the problems that those critiques inspired, have occurred in Western countries, now they see it. So now, all of a sudden, whereas in the 1990s and the 2000s, the idea was oh, look, uh, capitalism just beat uh, communism. The USSR is gone. So ca uh, capitalism must be even better than we thought. Let's go whole hog on free market capitalism. Uh, let's, let's, let's eliminate as many government interferences as possible or as much government interference as possible with the wonders of the free market. And it's going to you know, uh, work out great for everyone. They're not saying that tune anymore because the great financial crisis of 2008 kind of put paid to that, that ideology. Like you can't, I, I don't know if anyone is taken seriously anymore who, who is still a believer in that sort of thing. Now you have to, uh, in order to be taken seriously, you've got to put all sorts of, of little asterisks in your ode to free markets. And then those asterisks uh, uh, point you to a whole bunch of qualifications. Like, yeah, you know, uh, free trade and comparative advantage are still true, but but uh, there are some problems that we didn't really notice at first. Uh, I guess we do have to allow governments to do some real economic policy. I guess we do have to re-politicize economic policy so that democratic electorates have some sort of say uh, 
uh, over how their their national economic policy is going to be done. But again, you know, that's that's something that's a, a very uh, recent development, and I think it's a it's just a reaction to the collapse of the the neoliberal uh, international order that they loved so much. Okay, so I'm going to play uh, one last clip. This is uh, I can Barry explaining why, you know, explaining why he loves the liberal international order so much, what he thinks the the benefits of that order were, and why he wants to uh, uh, see it continue or be revitalized well into the future. Arguably, and this is my bottom line, if you were to look at the last 75 years from an American perspective, and I think from a wider perspective of the liberal democratic world, this was the most a successful uh, international order in world history defined in terms of three metrics, wealth creation, the absence of physical violence, uh, and a glimmering of social justice. So what went wrong, and these are uh, my last remarks, uh, uh, in some ways what happened was uh, uh, th these countries were a victim of their own success. Uh, the, the, the order had its highest functioning decades inside of the Cold War. And this is where John and I might disagree, but this is really when this order uh, crystallized, if you will. And it was in some sense, a kind of club, a kind of uh, subset of a larger international system uh, where uh, uh, free world states uh, could in, in, in create a kind of mutual aid society. Uh, uh, and to be in this order was to buy into a, a kind of suite of responsibilities of rights and obligations. There was a kind of logic of conditionality. You, you see this logic of conditionality in the EU, but it was also part of the liberal order. Uh, and it was an important component, and I make this argument in my book, because the old liberal vision of Wilson in the 19th century was of a kind of moral rectitude enforced by public world public opinion. Well, that was ridiculous. It didn't work. And, and this next generation of, of architects of order uh, realized that. And th in some sense, they said to be, to, to enforce good behavior, you have to, in some sense, create a club that, you, that, is, is, that is exclusive, that not everybody can get in, that to get in is to, to incentivize you to, to play by the rules and to, to advance uh, 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 your activities to promote this higher set of social purposes outside of a, of a mere kind of anarchic order. But what happened was this inside order became the outside order, that the, the club lost its club characteristics. It became more, and I argue this in the book, more like a, a shopping mall uh, 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 where states could wander in and wander out. I've also used the term public utility. Uh, you could uh, connect your pipes to the system, uh, this one, but not this one, the different providers, a, a kind of fragmentation of the, of the, of the coherence of the complex. Uh, uh, you could pick and choose. Uh, and of course, this is, again, uh, takes us back to, 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 to China. Uh, so where do we go from here? Uh, and I would just simply say, uh, uh, there are, you know, there, there's no, I don't think there's any uh, safe passage. I don't think there's any obvious and inevitable next era. I do think uh, states, liberal democracies will want to, to, to try to reimagine and recreate this order. Uh, after all, this order was, in some sense, built because they wanted to make themselves safe, to make the world safe for democracy. Democracies, all states are, but democracies in their own special way, very vulnerable types of polities. We know this all, it goes all the way back to Aristotle and Polybius, and then on to Machiavelli and, and uh, Montesquieu and uh, Alexander Hamilton, the kind of Republican political institutions are vulnerable to geopolitics. You need to have a kind of space, a zone of protection where your fragile institutions are not subject to garrison state incentives. And so you need to, in some sense, create, like you do for eggs, a kind of container. And the liberal order, in many ways, is, is an egg carton. So there's that, that uh, liberal view versus the, the realist view that, yes, the, the world is primarily characterized by anarchy. Uh, all states have to uh, amass power. Um, but if you, you can create a, an egg carton for these fragile types of polities, democracies, and that egg carton is a, a bunch of institutions uh, 
uh, that facilitate cooperation and reduce the, the, the risk of conflict and actually make uh, violent conflict far less likely because all the, the members, all the eggs in the carton can see that it's actually to their benefit to refrain from the use of force, uh, just naked power maximization uh, at the expense of their fellow eggs in the carton. Um, but and, and then, of course, the, the beauty of it in, in his mind is that uh, if you're in the club, you know, it's a, it's a big club and you ain't in it. No, um, most of the world's countries ain't in it. Uh, but the, the reason why he thinks it's important to be exclusive is that it's not just a, a matter of the, the rights you get, uh, as in uh, you, your products, when you export them, don't get hit with a huge tariff. So, you know, you, you can actually uh, uh, sell a lot more. You can export a lot more and help your economy that way. Uh, so you've, you've got that, but you also have duties. You also have to abide by the, the rules of the egg carton so that you can stay in the, the egg carton. And so his problem is that, or his kind of uh, explanation for why the, the liberal international order started to fall apart was by allowing China into the WTO and trying to incorporate it as, of course, a subordinate uh, partner in the, the, the global order. Uh, duties weren't, weren't uh, sufficiently enforced upon China. So they were able to just shop for the rights that they liked, the right to, to export without massive tariff barriers, uh, but they were not willing to adopt the, the, the various uh, duties that are supposed to be uh, incumbent upon all of the, the eggs in the carton. Uh, but of course, again, this is, you know, he, he, he actually says this at one point, uh, you know, this is a, a US perspective. Well, yeah, if you're Mike Tyson in the boxing ring, it seemed a ring, uh, <laughs> uh, it, it seems totally fair. Like we're all in the same ring. We're all fighting by the same rules. Like what's your problem? Uh, well, if you're not Mike Tyson, if you're nowhere near as 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 skilled and, and as strong as he is, well, you can start seeing some problems that Mike Tyson wouldn't be able to see from his own perspective as a, a world champion boxer. Well, it's the same thing. If if you're China entering the, the WTO in the early 2000s or just entering, being incorporated into the global capitalist system starting in the late 70s, uh, yeah, you, you can see, yeah, there's these, these rules that are supposed to apply to everyone, but we can pretty clearly see that there are exceptions that are made. There were exceptions made for Japan and Korea, Taiwan as well. Um, uh, the US, of course, carves out exceptions. The EU creates exceptions. Uh, what is this this free trade uh, model whereby uh, U.S. and EU agribusiness can get massive subsidies from their own governments and then sell their artificially uh, lower price products around the world, destroying small farmers uh, everywhere that they're sold? That that doesn't seem like a, a rules based system where everyone follows the same rules. So you've got that that issue that his belief in the the kind of perfection of the universality of of how the rules are applied is untenable. Um, but you also have the problem of if you're a weak uh, of entry, entrant into that system, you're a, a weak state in that system, following the rules is not a good idea. Uh, you should try to bend the rules whenever possible, because that's what all of the currently rich countries did when they were developing. When England was developing, when Germany was developing, when the United States was developing, they used protectionist measures to build up their own infant industries until the point that they were competitive on a global level. And then when a majority of their, their major enterprises in their economy had, had reached a level where they, they could compete, where they might actually beat Mike Tyson in a fight, in a fair fight, then they, they adopt this, oh yes, everyone should follow the, the same rules. But if you're not Mike Tyson, if you're a much weaker fighter, you're going to look for every little way to, to, to cheat and bend the rules and get whatever kind of tiny little advantage. Maybe what you're going to lean in and, and bite the other fighter's ear if you think somehow that's going to, to help you. That's the, that's the reality. And that's something that you would think a someone of a more realist persuasion like Mearsheimer would understand and then you know use that as as part of his argument against uh against liberalism in in general in the in the ir theory sense uh but i i don't see much evidence of that and again i think it's it's just a matter of when you're like i like mearsheimer coming from a u.s perspective your your colleagues are 
relatively well off. Uh, your country is the most powerful country in the system. Uh, and you've, you've also grown up during a time when anything with the, with the label socialist was, uh, something to, to stay far away from. It was a career killer. Uh, it would, it would make you just not be treated seriously by your, your peers, by even your students. Uh, you have that experience. And so you've, you've managed to insulate yourself from really powerful, really foundational critiques of the the global capitalist system and so you you're just blind to these problems and you just don't get why uh expecting weaker countries to follow the exact same rules is not a, a very realistic uh expectation especially given the hypocrisy of being from a, a country whether you're from the us or, or germany or japan or england when your country was at a, a low level of development and trying to to catch up with what it deemed to be its competitors in that day, they had no compunction against breaking the rules or bending the rules. Just as Mearsheimer would say when it comes to military competition, you know, international law is not going to impede any state from, from breaking it when it perceives, that is when its government perceives there to be an existential threat to the nation itself. So why can't you just use that same that exact same logic and apply it in the economic realm and understand that this is how it's going to be, especially when the 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 game is the way it is. If you're not at the top in the current global economic pecking order, uh, that doesn't just mean you know your 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 you lose face or your your ego is hurt or something silly like that. It means that uh, a whole massive segment of your population is going to be in in dire poverty that your economic strength and your your security is going to be threatened because you don't have the the, the top of the line production uh capabilities all throughout your economy and the, and so many of these technologies have dual uses for military uses as well so if you if you don't have the capacity to produce your own top of the line uh, aerospace products, uh, uh, semiconductor computer products, uh, networking products, et cetera, uh, you are going to have less military security as well. So then if you can understand that in the purely military realm, then why can't you understand that in the economic realm as well? Okay, so going back to the whole China bet uh, issue, let's uh, hear a little bit from Mearsheimer. John, this was a naive bet, right? You say that we were interested, that we had a vested interest in maintaining the balance of power in Asia. And of course that's true because we were by far the dominant power in Asia and we wanted to keep it that way. But if you pursue a policy that helps China grow its economy and turns it into an economic superpower, you are going to upset the balance of power by definition. How could it be otherwise? Well, it could have been otherwise if China had liberalized uh, in much the same way that, that Russia did in the 1990s, uh, politically liberalized uh, along with a, a kind of really rash, uh, fast crash therapy style of, of economic liberalization, then I don't see why we, we would expect any different result in China than we already saw in Russia in the 1990s when an estimated uh, between two and three million people died early because of the total breakdown of that society and that economic and political system. Uh, so it, it could have been otherwise and not just in, in that kind of more dramatic fashion, but if, if China had politically liberalized as well, which is exactly what uh, everyone in the US foreign policy establishment was, was hoping for. Well, then again, you've got a situation where individual Leviathans can translate their economic power into political power. So then what would have happened? Uh, I think most likely you would have had uh, individual, very wealthy people, uh, capitalists within China who control uh, industries of all sorts, who then, because they're also uh, in business with US corporations, there are closer ties there, and there can be a commonality of interest among some members of the, the Chinese capitalist class and investors in the US. And then because you have a, a politically liberal system where individual Leviathans can use their, their money to gain political power, well, then that could have been used to blunt uh, 
the the increase in in China's overall power. Uh, you can eliminate any sort of massive uh, uh, government economic program. Uh, you can basically have these individual leviathans having a veto over any sort of of massive investment. Uh, like the uh, stimulus package that the, the Chinese government engaged in after the great financial crisis, or the past couple decades worth of massive investments into renewable energy technology, which is the, the primary reason why wind and solar are now so competitive, uh, cheaper, uh, according to some measurements, than coal is uh, today. The only reason that that happened was because the, the Chinese government, because it was a, an illiberal system where the, the party rules and individual leviathans can be crushed by the one greater leviathan, which is the government, they were able to uh, use the, the social surplus, the, the excess resources they, they had, uh, to invest that into the development of uh, cheaper and cheaper uh, uh, wind turbines and solar panels. Uh, but if the, the dream of the US foreign policy establishment had come true, then you would have had, in, in Eikenberry's terms, he uses it elsewhere in this debate, more contestation within China. Right. You would have individual capitalist leviathans able to veto any sort of, of, of massive government economic program like that. And that, I think, would have effectively uh, reduced the, the, or it would have left China today with significantly less uh, political power or geopolitical power than it, than it actually has today. Because that, that process of contestation, that process of allowing little leviathans to fight it out and to impede the, the greater leviathan, the government, from uh, exacting or, or enacting its will, I think that would have effectively reduced uh, the, the accumulation of power that China actually did uh, over the past couple of decades. But now let's hear uh, Eikenberry's response. And I think it's actually pretty, uh, pretty good. He, he poses a, a challenging question for Mearsheimer. So here's Eikenberry after being dunked on massively, I think, uh, recovering fairly well and posing a, an interesting uh, uh, counterpoint. Um, we, we did make bets that turned out, as I said, to be wrong. Uh, but the counterfactual always puzzles me. The idea of, of a grand American grand strategy in the 21st century tied to a multi-generational effort to keep 1.2 billion people poor and unhappy. How do you do that? In what sense could we have had a different policy that would have been sustainable in an American democracy with values and institutions and traditions and a history of what we know about the world we live in, uh, how would we have contained or put the thumb on a, on a, such a large, proud country uh, in a way that would have made our lives today better off? And I said I thought that was a, a pretty good response uh, given Mearsheimer's argument, but there is an actual answer to that rhetorical question. You could just look at uh, U.S. foreign economic policy to much of the world. How do you keep uh, other countries uh, under your thumb, or or how do you keep the, the the screws turned tight on them? Well, whenever you have any sort of political movement that is trying to use the the resources of that country primarily for the benefit of the people of that country, so putting impositions and restrictions on foreign ownership and exploitation of that nation's resources, you either, well, first you, you attempt to, to make sure that they can never gain power, uh, propaganda campaign, et cetera. But if it looks like they might win an election uh, and all of the, the dirty tricks, uh, election interference, meddling, you know, all the, the stuff that uh, the Democrats over the past four years were, were complaining about with Russia, but instead of like that, imagine that, and then multiplied by, I don't know, uh, a thousand or so. So it's it's real meddling as opposed to the rather laughable, inept uh, attempts uh, by the, the Russian government in the U.S. over the past four or five years. Uh, if that doesn't work, well, then you can always just assassinate the guy. Uh, whoever whoever is, is leading this movement to use natural resources for the benefit of the people living in the, those countries, 
you overthrow him in a coup or her in a coup. Uh, you support a, a military dictatorship. You support uh, other political movements that are uh, part of the, the, the local oligarchy or the, the former ruling class who will make a deal with you, that is really with your uh, business sector, with your investors, with your corporations, uh, to give them access to uh, the country's natural resources and the, the country's human resources, uh, labor, at very favorable terms for the empire, for the US. That's how you keep uh, countries under your thumb. So there is an answer to that question, but again, I just don't think he's, he's really aware of this. Um, maybe he's aware of, of, of some of these, you know, the, the actual actions I've described, like maybe uh, uh, Lumumba's uh, assassination, uh, uh, the, the whole uh, use of uh, Pinochet in Chile against the Yende. He might, he might know these things, but I think he would, he would categorize them as, oh, well, this is, these were Cold War uh, uh, necessities. They were, you know, in the, in the context, you know, it was very important to make sure that, that someone who might not, who, who might ally with our, our massive, great, uh, scary enemy, uh, it was very important to, to prevent them from taking power. But I don't think, at least he doesn't evince any familiarity with the massive body of, of literature, you know, the, the evidence of this being a, 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 a wide-ranging, long-ranging policy of increasing national power at the expense of the rest of the world doing precisely the the types of things that i just mentioned but the fact that he could he could use this as a as a rhetorical device uh in his argument with mearsheimer can only only uh uh makes me think that he's just not aware of this lastly i just wanted to to give mearsheimer the last word uh this was fairly well fairly very disappointing uh, because I oftentimes over the past like two decades or so, whenever I've seen uh, uh, Mearsheimer asked to comment about uh, U.S. foreign policy, he's always been a, a, a very sensible voice, at least relative to the, the the kinds of voices you would typically get to hear in the mass media, in national newspapers and TV, etc. Uh, he would he would typically uh, urge for restraint as opposed to you know invading Iraq or Afghanistan or uh, uh, supporting the, the the rebels in Libya, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but here he really goes off the rails. I have a simple answer to that. I believe that there are three areas of the world that are worth fighting and dying for. Uh, one is Europe, two is East Asia, and three is uh, the Persian Gulf. And I believe that you only fight and die in those areas when there is a potential hegemon. Uh, there's no potential hegemon in Europe. I would have left Europe Put an end to NATO at the end of the Cold War. Uh, and uh, there's no potential hegemon in the Persian Gulf either. Therefore, I'd move to an over-the-horizon capability similar to the one you had uh, during the Cold War or the latter part of the Cold War with the rapid deployment force. The area where there's a potential hegemon is in East Asia, and that, of course, is China. And there's no doubt that China's neighbors cannot balance by themselves against a rising China so that the United States has to be there. And we are going to have to be there in a serious way. As I said before, I think both President Trump and President Biden understand that basic fact of life and we will be there. When I think of restraint, I think it, large, it largely in terms of ending the forever wars that Democrats and Republicans started uh, mainly after 2001. I think about ending the war in Afghanistan, ending the war in Iraq, basically getting out of the Middle East, getting out of these small wars and exercising restraint in the greater Middle East. But with regard to China, uh, unlike a number of my friends who profess the importance of restraint, I don't think we should show restraint vis-a-vis -vis China. I think we should go full bore to try to contain China. Uh, I'm not calling for a highly militaristic and aggressive foreign policy where we provoke a war with them, but I do think we wanna have a robust containment policy because 
Asia, East Asia in particular, matters strategically to the United States. And there's a serious threat there, obviously. Uh, there's a potential peer competitor in China. So we should focus there. So robust containment policy, go full bore, but don't provoke a war. Okay, right. Uh, again, you know, there's there's a huge just like deficit of of basic psychological knowledge that you know other people are not privy to what's going on in your head. You might be very convinced that all of the actions you take are purely for the sake of containment to prevent any sort of possible uh, uh, Chinese invasion plans of the of the region or or military domination of the region. That might be very clear in your head, but in other people's heads, it's not clear. They don't have access to your thoughts, so they very you know just as you would try to imagine what was going on, what is going on in, in other people's heads by interpreting their actions. So too, Chinese policymakers will look at US actions and try to uh, understand what is the motivation behind them on the basis of the actions, not their access to the thoughts going on inside the heads of the foreign policy blob, or the foreign policy elite. Uh, that's a huge problem where you can just think, Yes, a, a robust, very, very tough containment strategy, but then uh, think that or assume that that is never going to be interpreted as aggressive, even though uh, in recent Chinese history, just over the past hundred years, uh, they've been invaded by uh, several armies, several European armies, and then uh, worst by the, the Japanese Imperial Army. They actually have this experience, unlike the United States. Uh, you think that maybe that that bit of knowledge and just a little bit of, of psychological awareness might cue you in to the possibility of this very robust full bore containment strategy being misperceived. Let's even, you know, let's just assume it's a misperception. But to not recognize that, I think, is 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 stunning and and you know, frankly, just unbecoming of a realist, period. Um, but since we're talking about realism, I just wanted to end it off uh, with this. I can very brought up climate change very, very briefly as one of, I think he called it like one of the four headless horsemen of the apocalypse or, or some such thing. Um, but that was it. The, the rest of the discussion was typical 20th century IR thinking. And here we're facing an existential threat, which is is multifaceted but all of its components the things that 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 uh really should bother sh should should scare the hell out of to be frank uh people who care about the the world system or the world period uh, are not the the first order physical effects like rising sea levels or uh, uh changing weather patterns more intense storms longer droughts longer and more severe heat waves uh, 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 greater floods, et cetera. Those are the first order physical effects. Those are the things that climate scientists focus almost exclusively on, as they should, because that's that's their field, that's, that's what they do. But for people interested in politics, what's much more worrisome are the second order effects. What happens when we have one of these massive droughts that hits uh, Pakistan and or India or massive flooding that hits Bangladesh and wipes out food production? Or what happens when you have uh, heat waves in, in Russia and Europe that uh, harms food production as well, so that you have uh, massive increases in food prices around the world? Uh, what's gonna happen in these unstable states, uh, particularly like Pakistan, uh, when you have tens of millions of people on the verge of starvation and you know, you, you might have a, a rebellion against the government there or in India. That could increase tensions between India and Pakistan. Both of them are nuclear armed powers. It's very easy to see how uh, a, a horrendous war could start just as the result of some of these first order effects. The second order effects are what we have to worry about. What happens when you have tens of millions of people in, in grave danger of, of starvation because of those first order effects. The, those kinds of damages are 
far greater than anything that's that's really seriously contemplated vis-a-vis uh, -vis the U.S. and, and China. Uh, particularly, you know, like Mearsheimer is is saying explicitly here, like, no, I, I want a very uh, full bore, uh, tough containment strategy, but I, I don't want war. I don't want to provoke a war. Well, that's your intentions are absolutely lovely. I, I, I think that's great. Um, but anything that, that you're perceiving, maybe, a, a, you know, some uh, uh, economic warfare between the, the, the two countries, maybe uh, uh, at the very worst, uh, a few shots fired back and forth over, over Taiwan or, or something, but which immediately get uh, suppressed and no wider war breaks out. Compare those sorts of worries with the extremely real worries of climate change and the second order effects that they threaten. And you can see how, as I forget the, the name of the, the author who made this, this case in a paper, but he said, when, when you have so-called realists who aren't talking about physics, climate change is, is physics. It's not, these are, if you're looking for laws, scientific laws, you can find them in physics, you can find them in chemistry. Uh, you can't find them in the social sciences. That's just, again, that's 20th century philosophy of science. It was dead uh, before the, the 20th century was over. It's not tenable anymore. You're not, you're not, it's just, it's deeply unserious uh, to, to be thinking in these terms. But if you want laws, how about the laws of physics, which are, are underlying all of climate science and are at the foundation of the, the real threats, the, the serious, life-threatening, even existential threats that we face. So as this guy was, was arguing, to be a realist that isn't looking at, at climate science and isn't incorporating uh, climate change and the ecological crisis more broadly into everything that you do, what, what is that other than utopianism? You might still claim the mantle of realism and say, oh yeah, you know, we, we don't um, engage in these fantasies about the, what, what the world could be because we're such hard-headed, tough-minded realists who only look at the world as it is. Well, if you're not looking at the world as it is when it comes to physics, when it comes to the ecological crisis that we're facing, then your so-called realism is a very weird sort of utopianism. At least most sorts of utopianism I could think of are imagining a, a wonderful world. Your freakish form of utopianism is, is, is making the, the current somewhat dystopian system of it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, morality doesn't really have any uh, role to play in international relations because it's a category error, uh, it's an anarchic system. It's an amoral system. Morality doesn't have any role to play. To me, that that seems pretty dystopian. But nonetheless, by ignoring reality here, your so-called realism is utopianism. It's fundamentally not realistic. And so that's why well, I, I recommend you guys watch the the whole debate. Um, but you'll you'll. Uh, you'll, you'll see this. This is not a, a, a main core of contention here. Uh, the, the demise of the liberal international order, lots of attention. China, the big new bogeyman China, another big uh, area of, 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 uh, of attention. But climate change doesn't play a role. And as uh, Anatole Levin uh, uh, argued in his, his recent book, uh, you know, just a, one tiny little example. You know, there, there are these series of, of islands uh, in the South China Sea that are part of, uh, I think, the Philippines uh, uh, zone of control. And China's currently building uh, some sort of military bases, some airstrips or what have you. These are islands that are basically at sea level. And his point was, if you were really a realist and you were a, a United Statesian realist, so you want the, the US to, to amass as much power as possible, you wouldn't be uh, contesting the, the building of these, these military bases, you should be applauding the Chinese government for building these bases because they are a perfect waste of money and resources. Uh, these are islands that are going to be gone in 10, 20, maximum 30 years. So, you know, if uh, a realist U.S. foreign policy would be, 
you know, patting China on the back and saying, hey, do you want any, do you want any help? I mean, we don't want to give you any resources, but, you know, uh, we can send some advisors over there to, to help you uh, build more. Actually, we think you should, you should build those uh, island bases even larger. Uh, think big, guys. Uh, go for it. You know, that, that, again, that would be real realism. But when you're not looking at physics, when you're not looking at climate science, when you're not incorporating the existential ecological crisis that all of humanity is facing, you're not a realist. I'm sorry. Uh, that is just not a, a, a tenable word to use to describe your position. You could be a dystopian utopianist, I suppose would be the, the closest thing I could come uh, up with. But a realist is something you most certainly are not. And I think it makes them uncomfortable because their their whole intellectual formation was was based on writers in the 20th century, uh, largely talking about European history since the 15, 14th century, 15th century, 16th century, whenever they they usually start. Uh, and so it's very difficult for them to, to understand the present world we inhabit, which is a world that is faced with an unprecedented unprecedented existential threat that is not in the form of a state or a government or a nation. Uh, and it's a threat that actually the liberal internationalists should be much more, uh, they should be focusing on this much more because if they're looking for a way to salvage their liberal internationalist project, well, climate change is probably the best, perhaps only way for them to salvage their project. Because what does climate change require more than absolutely anything else? An unprecedented in human history level of international cooperation to restructure the entire global economic system. That sounds like it's right in the wheelhouse of a, of a liberal internationalist, but at least in this one uh, debate, uh, not very much present. And, and from my reading, uh, it still is very much peripheral in international relations scholarship, uh, which makes the, the utility of, of IR uh, scholarship next to nil. That's, they're, they're imagining we're still living in the 20th century. Sorry, guys, we're not. But anyway, I do recommend you, uh, you watch the, the rest of the debate, the whole debate. And uh, I would say, uh, you know, since I talk about psychological biases and I, I talk about other people exhibiting them, uh, I also am, am prey to the very same psychological biases. And one that's relevant right now is one called the curse of knowledge that we're very bad. All of us are very bad at understanding what other people don't know that we know. So when it comes to, to this debate uh, or just introducing IR overall, I don't really know how I should be explaining it. Uh, I, I don't know what I should cover and what I don't really need to because you guys already know it. So please uh, feel free to educate me and let me know uh, what I should be focusing on and what you know I don't need to bother with. All right. Bye, guys.